You are listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast with Maggie Green, episode number 267. Welcome to the Cookbook Love Podcast, a podcast that celebrates cookbook readers, buyers, collectors, writers, and clubs. And now your host, cookbook author, culinary dietitian, and cookbook writing coach, Maggie Green. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. How's everybody doing today? Very excited to be here to talk to you about cookbook deals, which is the contract that we get when we sign with a traditional publisher to write a cookbook. But before we get started, just a little bit of an update. We had a great weekend this past weekend. We went to West Lafayette, Indiana to visit our oldest son who is finishing up his senior year at Purdue University. They played Ohio State in college football and they lost pretty bad. They even missed a couple of field goals, which to me is always a fascinating thing. And um, we had a great time. We I packed up some food and uh, fed some people. We enjoyed some breakfast before the game. And then a couple weekends ago, Warren did some uh, pork shoulder barbecue, and we took that with us, and we had some dinner with the kids and just had a really great time. I love doing stuff like that. Two of the things I value the most are education and experiences together with my family and friends, and both of those were completely checked off this weekend, not only because my children were there, but one of my sisters flew in from uh, Florida and her husband is a huge Ohio State fan. So we got to spend the weekend together and had a really good time. So that's kind of an update on what's going on. And I've been thinking a lot about this show and what I wanted to talk about today. And I want to tell you a little story about how I got my first cookbook deal and how that evolved into more cookbook deals through getting the first cookbook deal. And the reason I've been thinking about this a lot is because I've been thinking a lot about you if you want to write a cookbook. I've been thinking a lot about my students who are inside my Get Paid to Get Published program who want to get a traditional cookbook deal. And I've been thinking then a lot about my journey through cookbook writing and cookbook publishing and how that all kind of lines up. So I thought what I would do is walk you through a little bit about how I got my cookbook deal, how that led to other cookbooks, and then tell you a little bit about what I think you need to focus on if you want to do the same. Okay, so let's go back a ways here to 1996. I opened my business, The Green Apron Company, and I worked as a personal chef cooking privately for people in their homes. Now, this was coupled with having a degree in nutrition, and I decided that I wanted to cook privately for people. I cooked for clients all over the greater Cincinnati area. I had over 100 personal chef clients in this four-year period, and did a lot of cooking and nutrition work for people during those four years. But one of the things I always have valued is volunteering to connect with other people in the industry. And I did in particular uh, get involved in the Chef's Collaborative here in Cincinnati. And they were having a fundraiser where they paired local chefs with local farmers or food producers for a ticketed event and dinner And I volunteered to help at that fundraiser. And I did not have my own restaurant, but since I was cooking privately for people in their homes, so I said to them, just pair me with somebody and I will help them. I envisioned going to their restaurant and helping them prepare whatever food they were going to prepare for that evening. Well, as luck would have it, and I don't really understand completely how things like this happen, but it's something that I love about life is just the random coincidences and occurrences. But I got paired with Ethan Becker. Ethan Becker is the grandson of Irma Rombauer, the author of The Joy of Cooking. She was the original author in 1931, and Ethan was the co-author of The Joy of Cooking at the time. 
So what we, I was to do was to meet him at his house, and we were going to prepare a mushroom soup from the 1931 edition of Joy of Cooking using local mushrooms grown here in Kentucky. I think we had oyster mushrooms and uh, some shiitakes. They were cultivated. They were delicious. And we made this really great mushroom soup with this beautiful arugula uh, garnish. But when I got to Ethan's house, which was where his test kitchen and recipe development center was, we needed, I, I got there and he was um, finishing getting ready, having his coffee, and there were some dishes in the sink. And so I decided to just jump in and get the dishes cleaned up so that we could proceed with making the soup. Um, that is part of, I guess, who I am. I grew up in a big family and I knew that washing the dishes was something that was going to be necessary in order for us to proceed with cooking. And I also had been around, of course, being a personal chef, working in other people's kitchens, keeping their kitchen clean as I cooked. And my first, my job as a food service director at a, at a nursing home, I knew that I all this dish work was part of cooking. So I just did the dishes. Uh, we had a beautiful night. We made the soup. It was very delicious. I met uh, his wife, Susan. Uh, we had a great evening and cleaned up for the night, went home. The phone rang the next day, and it was Susan, Ethan's wife, asking me if I would be interested in coming over to talk to them about possibly working with The Joy of Cooking to help Ethan start documenting recipes that he was developing for the next edition of Joy, which was coming out in 2006. Uh, they didn't know that. They didn't have a contract for that book at that time, but they knew that they were getting close to when a revision was going to be done. They envisioned publishing one for the 75th anniversary of Joy, which was in 2006. So I said, sure. I went over, talked to them. They told me what they wanted me to do, the role that I would serve. Is that Ethan loved to cook. He's a great cook, um, always inventing things in the kitchen, but I would be the person that documented everything. I was going to write down what he cooked and uh, write out the first uh, version of the recipe for us to go in and retest and then uh, decide about using in the book. And Susan said to me when I got there, she said, you know, when you came over to help Ethan, what we noticed was that you just jumped in and did the dishes. And a lot of people, when they come into Ethan's kitchen, were always like looking for direction. And they were just impressed that I was willing to wash the dishes. And of course, with also with myself, I think I love to document things. I love to write things down. I, I, I love to keep notebooks, keep track of things. So the work that they wanted me to do with Ethan completely fit into what my strengths were. So of course I said yes. Um, continued to work with Joy and became an editorial liaison with their publisher in New York. And I was very heavily involved in the publishing and the putting together of the 2006 edition of The Joy of Cooking. I'm something very proud of and something that um, happened to me. And I had the, the coincidences and everything lined up. But I believe that there were two things about me that really made that job possible. Number one, I volunteered my time. And number two, I was willing to wash the dishes. Now, I'm going to tie all this together at the end and let you know what this has to do with the cookbook deal. But just keep those two things in mind. Plus, the job really was aligned with what I love to do, which is documenting things in notebooks, writing things down, keeping track, and cooking. And Ethan and I cooked together, and I love to document. We had a, a great relationship. I can text Ethan today and continue to keep in touch with him. And um, just has been was a really wonderful part of my journey here in, in the cookbook world. Well, as you can imagine, after I did that, some a few more doors opened up. I went on to edit Bakewise by Shirley Courier. I worked on the Ultra Metabolism book by Dr. Mark Hyman. I got asked to ghostwrite cookbook chapters for other cookbook authors and did a lot of work in the traditional cookbook publishing space, still as an editorial role or recipe development role, um, nutrition analysis role, not yet even writing a cookbook of my own. And in 2008, I was asked to judge a fundraiser at a local event for a local community. It's called the Living Arts and Science Center in Lexington, Kentucky. 
And would I be a judge for this dessert competition? And I said, sure. So the volunteering, of course, comes in again there. I said, yes, uh, I do that a lot. If something is aligned with what I like to do and I'm offered the opportunity to do it, I will usually say yes. Uh, I consider that to be a gift to be asked. And I typically, like I said, say yes. So I went to the fundraiser, uh, had a fun night. It was very interesting being a judge, though, because I had to taste so many desserts. And every time I watch the Great British Bake Off, I think about Paul and Prue having to like eat and taste all that bread and desserts. And I think it's a very fascinating thing that they do. But while I was there, I met this lady who was uh, participating in the fundraiser as a guest. And she asked me if I had ever thought about writing a cookbook of my own. And I said, well, maybe. I don't spend a lot of time dwelling on it, but uh, I think it would be great. And she handed me her business card and she said, if you ever have any ideas, I want you to reach out to me and let me know. So I've told you this part of the story before because I sat on that question for a year. Have you ever thought about writing a cookbook of your own? And I know I have asked many of you that question, if not on this podcast, through the emails that I write, but have you ever thought about writing a cookbook of your own? And what I always got tripped up on was, did I have anything worth writing about that other people would be interested in? And was it worth it to write the cookbook? Now, I've talked about other things. Is it worth it? Do I have any worth? Is there any value in this? And after a year, I finally decided the only thing I could present to this publisher was my commitment to home cooking here in my kitchen in Kentucky on a year-round basis. And the reason I knew I did that was because I actually was doing it for my own family. I had three children at this time. There were five of us here, and we ate most meals every day of the week at home. Um, I was the lead on that because it's something I love to do and something I enjoy doing. And it fit in perfectly with the work I did in the uh, nutrition and cooking space. But did I have anything worth presenting to a publisher? So I got out this notebook where I had kept track for two years of everything I cooked and baked for our family. That ties into my love of documenting things. And it wasn't detailed, fully written out recipes. It wasn't everything developed and tested, but it was a list of what I cooked and baked. And I saw the seasonality. So I pitched a book to this publisher called From My Kentucky Kitchen, 12 Months of Fresh Homemade Food at Home, something like that. That's called the working title of your book. If you're pitching a cookbook to a publisher, chances are your title's going to get changed because it's, they want a marketable title, something that grabs people's attention. But that's the book that I, I pitched. They accepted the offer and the book was written in 20, not 2009 to 2010. It went into production in 2010. The publisher fully edited, designed, and printed that book. They paid me royalties off the book. I did not have to worry about anything about creating the book itself. That's what traditional publishers do. They do it for us. But my job was to provide the content for the book. And uh, I did that with all the notes and stuff that I had based on what I cook here in my kitchen in Kentucky. It's published in 2011. Okay, so that's deal number one. And I just want you to see that I did not get that cookbook deal by like running around trying to find a publisher and focusing on getting the deal. It sort of fell in my lap through a series of times that I said yes and opened myself up to things that were new and different. And opportunities came through volunteering at the Chef's Collaborative event saying that I want to help. I don't have a restaurant. Now, I could have I could have just as easily said, oh, no, I'm not a restaurant chef. I'm not going to participate in that chef's collaborative. I'm not as worthy as a restaurant chef, but I didn't do that. Because I think that we need to have people who are participating in events uh, represent all different aspects of the food service industry. And I just said I wanted to do it. I got paired with Ethan. I got to his house. I washed the dishes. I got offered a 
a very part-time role, developing recipes, documenting what he cooked, leaning into my strengths, and went on, of course, to judge that other dessert competition. Have you thought about writing a cookbook of your own? Can you see what I'm driving at here? I was literally leaning in to all the things that I enjoyed and loved doing. Nutrition and cooking were the foundation of that. Cooking for my family was the foundation of that. Washing dishes, saying yes, volunteering for events, documenting what I, co- what I cooked, knowing, and this was the part that was the hardest for me, was that believing that what I did every day in my kitchen was worth it to publish, to ch- pitch to a publisher that it was worthy of that, that it had value, and that other people would glean value from something like that. That is what I did to get my first cookbook deal. Then uh, then I got an email a couple years later, do I know of a Kentucky-based food writer that would be interested in writing a cookbook for this particular publisher that was emailing me, thinking that I was going to refer them to another Kentucky food-based writer? And that's possible I would have done that, but I, I said, sure, I'll, I'll think about it. And as I started to think about it, I thought, why don't I pitch myself as the author of that book? And so I did, and they said yes, and I went on to write Tasting Kentucky Favorite Recipes from the Bluegrass State. That was published in 2016. Now, I could have just as easily never pitched myself as the author of that second cookbook, but I knew I could do it. I knew I had the chops because I had done one cookbook before. And they knew that I was connected in Kentucky. I don't know that they expected me to pitch myself, but I did. So we have to kind of be our own advocate. We have to be willing to put ourselves out there. We have to be willing to get a yes. But in order to get that yes, we have to be willing for them to say no. And that publisher could have very easily have said no to me, but they were looking for a Kentucky-based food writer. I had written another Kentucky cookbook. I thought that I was the perfect person to write that book. And that is not egotistical. It is based in the way I feel about the work that I'm capable of doing and the work that I knew I could do for their book. And I truly believed that. And I did a great job. I had a lot of fun doing that book. I got recipes donated from over 100 cafes, bed and breakfast, restaurants all across the state of Kentucky. It was a whole different kind of cookbook project, but that was the second contract that I received. Then in the meantime, I'm still cooking for my family. Now, one thing I want you to uh, listen to very closely here if you want to write a cookbook and you have a family is you can serve your family any of the food that you're cooking or baking for a cookbook project. If you're already cooking for your family, why not combine that with recipe development work that you're doing for your book or recipe development work that you're doing for a cookbook proposal? My kids didn't like everything that I cooked for a cookbook project. And we were even talking about this when we were together over the weekend uh, some of the some of the food that I had to prepare for some of the books wasn't like quote unquote kid friendly, but I've always bought in to what I learned from Ellen Satter about feeding children is that they're where I'm the adult and I'm responsible for what I put on the table, but they get to choose how much they eat. And children and their appetites are self regulating; they will not go hungry. So if there was a meal that I cooked that maybe wasn't particularly kid-friendly, that they didn't love, they would still self-regulate and eat and catch up the next day. I was never, ever worried about that. Or I could feed them a snack before they went to bed, and uh, they would get their little tummies filled that way too. So that's kind of a little bit of a diversion, but I always blended what I was cooking for my family with every cookbook project I worked on. And I believe that that's part of the reason why uh, my children have turned into adventurous eaters because they were exposed to a lot of different kinds of foods while they were growing up through the cookbook projects that I was working on. Okay, so in the midst of all that, like I said, I'm still cooking at home, and I started to think about stocking pantries and 
Sometimes cookbooks like recommend all these pantry items just in this random pantry list, but A, the recipes that are in the book never call for what's on the pantry list. And B, sometimes we put things in a recipe that we only use one time. And I know that cookbook users don't always like that. In particular, if they don't want to invest in a ton of different ingredients, they don't want to make the monetary investment, maybe they don't have the space, they don't even have the access to getting these ingredients. So I really wanted to pare that down. And I wanted a pantry list in a cookbook that meant something, that meant that if you stock your food with these items, these pantry items, I promised two things. Number one, everything on that list would be used in recipes in the book. And number two, all they would have to do is buy the fresh and restock the pantry as things ran out. So I wrote two books. I wrote The Essential Plant-Based Pantry and I wrote The Essential Pantry. But I pitched them to a publisher. I pitched the concepts to the publishers And the publisher I had a connection with through the first book that I wrote, they accepted the proposal and I went on to um, get the cookbooks published in 2018. So that was five years ago. So those are my four cookbook deals, Kentucky Fresh in 2011, Tasting Kentucky in 2016, and the Essential Pantry and the Essential Plant-Based Pantry in 2018. So how did I get these cookbook deals if I wasn't running around looking for publishers, trying to find publishers, Um, And it's because I wasn't focused on the deals and the contracts and finding publishers. I was just being myself. My love of going to the grocery, my love of uh, operating a functioning kitchen here in my house, my love of cookbooks, my love of recipes, my willingness to volunteer my time, my willingness to wash dishes my dedication to documenting what I cook, keeping track of what I cook, my dedication to documenting a lot of things. I take a lot of notes about a lot of things and uh, my commitment to being engaged in the cooking process from beginning to end in all different kinds of places, including my commitment to doing that this past weekend when we went to the football game. I mean, I one of my strengths is I can think ahead and, okay, we're going to have about 10 or 15 people. We're going to make some breakfast casseroles. I planned what we were going to have. I went to the grocery. I did some prep here at the house. I finished it at my son's house and we had breakfast. Um, I'm not afraid to say that I'm really good at that. This is my strength. So let's talk about you for a minute. Let's focus on you instead of on me. You have a choice in this matter if you want to write a cookbook. We can sit at our houses and focus on finding publishers, and focus on cookbook deals. That, to me, all sounds very, uh, that's like the hard skills and like the hard side of publishing, the part that I don't think sounds very fun. Or you can choose to focus on being yourself and to focus on what makes you stand out, what makes you different the things that you love to do. Because that's what people notice. When you stand out from all the other people who are in your whatever, you stand out. The fact that I was willing to wash those dishes made me stand out to Ethan and Susan. They told me that. They said half the time when people walk in this kitchen, they don't know what to do. Now, I tend to be uh, a leader, I was willing to wash the dishes. I didn't wait for direction. I knew we were going to have to ultimately wash them anyway. There wasn't anybody else that was going to, Ethan or Susan maybe would have washed them, but I thought, well, since I'm here and I'm involved in this cooking process and I'm in the kitchen to create food for this fundraiser, I'm going to wash these dishes. I also allowed time to connect with other people through volunteering my time in the spaces where food and cooking were involved. And I still lean toward those kind of volunteer activities today. If it involves delivering food, preparing food, buying food, shopping for food, anything like that, I'm always very attracted to giving my time and effort for that because it's twofold. First of all, I get to share my skills, I get to share my time, and I get to connect with other people who are involved in the food service industry. 
And then the third thing is I stay committed to my weekly practice of planning and shopping for daily cooking here in my home. Even though there are less of us living in this house, I have a practice of planning what I'm going to eat, shopping for the ingredients I need, and daily preparing food for myself. And then I also spend a lot of time just paying attention to what's going on around me, to what people are talking about, to what's showing up uh, in food trends. I love to pay attention to what people are doing, what people are buying. I get some newsletters where I kind of like just can kind of, you know, pay attention and keep track of that kind of thing. I still document a lot. I write down, I made a Thai green curry the other night and I I have a list of the ingredients that I usually, I buy the little bottles of green curry, but there's things I put in it to like boost up the flavor. I have a little notebook where I wrote that down. So every time I make it, I pull out the notebook and I add those things to it. So like developing my cooking and adding new things to what I cook is always part of who I am and what I do. And I keep track of it. One of the things that I hear a lot of you say is I just cook and cook. And the chasm between cooking and recipes is that, people don't write anything down. So getting a system, although that sounds kind of like a cold skill, but getting some kind of a process where you're writing things down in your kitchen is important if you want to start to develop recipes for your own cookbook project. Or like I mentioned a couple weeks ago, write a cookbook where you get recipes donated and give people credit. And your, sh- your, your book works to share other people's recipes rather than you having to develop them. It's always totally possible. You can find this is a cookbook with a, a hundred recipes for the best white cakes that you could ever. I always say cakes because they're <laughs> something I don't do, but yeah, the best cakes I could ever find. I don't know. Just made that up. But pay attention and document. Create a little system for how you're keeping track of what you cook. And then also um, I leaned into... I still publish cookbooks. I still develop recipes. I still talk about cookbooks. I still talk to cookbook authors. And this summer, I this I I ran the twelve week program cookbooks on KDP, which is cookbooks where we published on Kindle Direct Publishing. I'm finishing uh, editing the cookbook that I worked on then. So I'm still in the in the habit and the practice of uh, documenting recipes, developing recipes and writing cookbooks. Although this last little book I wrote was one that I published myself because I wanted to learn how to do it. And one of the best ways to learn is to teach about how to do it. And that's exactly what I did this past summer. So if you want to stand out to a publisher, you need to focus on what makes you different. As a cook, If I'm a cook and you're a cook, we both love different things about this whole process. Maybe you don't love going to the grocery. Maybe you don't love uh, volunteering or washing dishes. That's fine. What's important is that you know what you do love about your time in the kitchen and around food. And why don't you think about that maybe, I guess, as sort of the homework for this is what you really love about cookbooks. I'm going to have an interview coming up with someone who reached out to me uh, through email that listens to the show that doesn't want to write a cookbook, but is in the collection space, the cookbook and recipe collection space. And if, and if you love that, and that's what you enjoy doing, um, lean into everything that you love. And that is what's going to make you stand out. Because you don't want to be like me. And I don't necessarily want to be just like you. We'll have some overlap. But if you're wanting to write a cookbook, what will make you stand out to a publisher is everything that makes you different from other cookbook authors. So one of the objections I often hear is, well, there's so many books about that topic already written. Do we need more cookbooks about that topic? And I'm going to use the example of cookies because that is the example that I can think of right off the top of my head. Do we need another cookie cookbook? But what if by just being you, you have all these cookie tips, things you love about cookies, ways you do cookies, ways you shop for cookies, ingredients you use in cookies that 
sets you apart because it's your way of doing cookies. That is valuable to somebody. And that is where you have to work on your belief and your own self-value and self-worth of what you have to offer. And lean into all the things you love. Put yourself in rooms where food people hang out and show up. Be willing to do all the things involved in baking, from ingredient shopping to whatever, washing dishes, volunteering, documenting what you do, talking about what you do, loving what you do. And you never know who's going to be in those rooms where you are. If you stand out and you take the lead in what you love, someone will notice. And that's the secret way to land a cookbook deal. You can sit at your computer and write a proposal and send it out to publishers all day long and agents all day long. And that may land you a book deal. But I always tell my students that we're going to only send it to publishers that we know are in alignment with what they want to do. And part of their job is to continue to lean into who they are and what they do and what they love and sell themselves on themselves so that they can sell a publisher on what they have to offer in their book. And we do the work of writing the proposal and building our platform on one side, but we're always leaning into what we love on the other side. And that's sort of like the secret missing ingredient that not a lot of people are talking about. We talk about what sets us apart, but it's really what makes you, you, and what makes me, me. And that's two different things, because if another person comes along and writes a Kentucky cookbook, which they have and which they will, it will not be the same as mine because I'm me and they are them. And we love and focus and enjoy two different types of things. And that's reflected in the books that we write. So that is how I got four cookbook deals by being myself. And If you need to listen to this again and think about your journey in cooking, what you do in cooking, the coincidences and and great things that have happened to you because of cooking, uh, what you cook every day, how you serve your family, how you serve your friends, how you shop, how you clean up, all those things, what you love about it, start to lean into all of those things and believe that there's sometimes a... Some people call it the universe. Some pe- I choose to call it God, but there are other forces at work that we can't even see that sometimes are working in our favor to get us to where we want to go. And I never really was even entertaining a cookbook or a cookbook deal for myself when all of this started. So sometimes we just have to kind of like let go of that goal and just lean into what we love. And of course, if you're trying to make money or you're an entrepreneur, <clears throat> you know, cooking privately for people in their homes is lucrative. Selling meal plans and uh, building a course or a membership is lucrative. Uh, doing recipe development work outside of what you do in your kitchen for other people is lucrative. Writing about food, writing about nutrition, all lucrative ways you can make money in this space. Doing what you love, enjoying what you do, and seeing if a publisher or an editor isn't hanging out in some of these rooms. Because I promise you will get noticed by being different from everyone else. And for me, that difference all started back in 2000 when I washed dishes at Ethan Becker's house. That's what made me stand out. And that was what started this whole avalanche of great things that I've been able to do in the cookbook world over the past 20 years. And then I haven't even really talked about 2018 to today, but that's where I started the podcast. I coach cookbook writers. I work with people who want to write their own cookbooks. But I thought for today it would be fun to do this. So that is how I got my first four cookbook deals. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed this podcast. Tune in next week for some more fun interviews from other cookbook authors. And as always, this is Maggie Green. And until next time, have a great day. Keep loving what you do. Be yourself 
and keep loving your cookbooks. Thanks for listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast. You can find out more information at www.cookbooklove.co. 